For a session presented by Amparity, please welcome the CEO of Amparity, Barry Paget, in discussion with Skift X Research Editor Dan Marsek. Hello, everyone. Barry, thanks for joining me. Um, a little bit of a heavy topic to, fo uh, to follow. <laughs> But it's a nice reminder. We'd like to thank Mariana for being here. And it's a good reminder of how important travel really is to all of us. Um, and it's not a perfect segue, but it is a segue into what we're here to talk about today, which is getting to know your customers better and really understanding them, um, talking about customer data and how we can use it to better personalize the, the traveler journey. So Barry, Amparity has a unique perspective, because you guys don't just work in travel. You work across all, all sectors. How would you characterize? the travel industry's journey right now in terms of its customer data initiatives. And specifically, why is this something that travel executives and companies need to think about across their organizations and not just, say, in IT or marketing or analytics? Yeah, and I uh, also want to just recognize the hard, the hard pivot here from a, a really serious topic to, to talking about customer data, which is also serious, but not in the same way. So you know, our, our thoughts and support are with the Ukrainian people. So thanks for having me. Uh, you know, I spent 20 years in travel tech at a company called Concur uh, that some of you may know. Uh, I led that company and I led a company called TripIt. And, you know, through those, those couple of decades, uh, you know, the joy and the pain of the, of the travel industry as it relates to data is that we get a lot of data uh, in the travel space. We get a lot of PII, personally identifiable information, which is great. It's, this is the gold that, you know, a lot of other categories or industries don't get quick serve restaurants, retailers, et cetera. So we have a lot of data uh, in the travel space. And you know, the pain in that story is the source uh, of all that data. It's sometimes direct, it's indirect, it's through aggregators, it comes from partners, and that's unique uh, to the travel space in terms of just the copies of our data that sits around a particular interaction, a hotel room, uh, a car reservation, a flight. And I think there was a gentleman from uh, American yesterday right. talking about the fact that we get different experiences based on what, where that copy of data lives. So as a business traveler, I'm treated uh, as royalty when I board uh, versus when I book a vacation with my family. Uh, it might come from my personal email address and you know, I'm, I'm one of the schleps uh, at, at that point. And so there's joy and pain in the customer data story and travel primarily related to just the uh, complexity in the way we gather and store data and from just the myriad of places it comes from. Right, and uh, we're gonna pull up a slide here. Uh, we conducted a custom survey and a research report with Amparity earlier this year, and this speaks exactly to what you were talking about. About 30% of travel executives said that they have either all the customer data that they want or need, or that they have high quality, complete, and accurate customer data. Actually, like, when I saw those numbers, I was, it's not bad, but that means that there's 70% of executives who are not exactly pleased with what, where they are. So, Barry, the question here is, where do you see those gaps, not only from where travel companies might be and where they want to be, but really where the customer expects them to be in terms of how they're using that data? Sure. Well, I think the interesting stat is the one that you called out, which is that 70% of travel leaders think that they don't have all the data they need. And I think there's a misconception that we need more data, and more data is better. Uh, and the reality is we have so much data that we don't know what to do with it today. And the challenge is that access is really, really hard. And so the perception, therefore, is we must not have all the data we need because it's so hard to get it. Uh, and I think you know, when you look at companies that get this right, uh, take a, a company, for example, that stitches together their transactional data from their, from their revenue systems and maybe the behavioral data from their email and marketing uh, systems. And what you'll find is that when someone calls uh, customer support, uh, instead of tell me your life story, it's, hey, I noticed that there's a disruption to your, to your trip. Uh, I noticed that you were on the website trying to cancel your booking or trying to change your booking. You can imagine how delightful that would be for us, uh, given all of this revenge travel that's happening right now and just the unprecedented levels of demand, coupled with staff shortages, shorter booking windows, a lot of disruption out there. And so I think the, the, the kernel here is that we have the data to go and serve these really basic use cases of knowing who our customer is and understanding what it is that they likely want or need from us at that particular moment. We just don't have the tooling and the platforms yet to enable those teams and those systems that require the data. Right, so 
you laid some of the groundwork talking about how travel is unique in, in some ways. What are some of the opportunities to start stitching all of that together? What does that look like? Yeah, well, I think you know, travel, again, is unique in that we're a collection of micro experiences. You know, unlike maybe going to the grocery store, there's not a lot of pre-grocery activity. There's you're you know, buying your groceries, sure, but there's not a lot of post-grocery activity either. And there's not that many partners involved. It's usually you, a shopping cart, and some, some aisles. Uh, and so you think about our experience in travel, where we have so much opportunity to engage and delight and serve our customer before the experience even begins. Certainly, while it's happening, think about a, a hotel experience where we have all of these opportunities for uh, engaging in entertainment and, and services around food and nightlife. And then post, a lot of travel is for business. And so how do we ensure that expenses are easy at the end? How do we ensure that there's a feedback mechanism if it was a family or a personal-based trip? So we're unique in that we have all of this pre and post in addition to what's going on during the experience. And so it creates both opportunity and yet more pain. Uh, because what happens is we get the opportunity to, uh, to get it wrong more often than a lot of other industries, right? When we serve someone uh, an ad that says, we have no idea that you're about to travel in two days uh, because we're trying to sell you a trip. Or I'm trying to sell you 50,000 miles when you have a million and a half in your, in your mileage account. Uh, those are opportunities, unfortunately, that we get wrong more often than not, not because of uh, our, our will to disappoint, but because of the lack of con connectivity between all this data. Right, so I guess the question is, what's the solution? Uh, I'm gonna pull up another slide here. We're talking about all this data somewhat abstractly in the sense that we know that there's a lot of it, and, and where is it coming from? Um, obviously, there's third-party data from OTAs, Google, social media. This is really important data that's coming in. We found that only 34% of executives were confident in using that data to make that experience better, just like you're explaining. And what was even more surprising and kind of shocking to me is that 24% of executives said they were very confident in using their own loyalty data to retain their customers. So even when they're getting the first party data, which is you know, information that you're getting directly from your customers, they're not exactly sure how to use it. So how do we start to not only make sure that we're getting that first party data, which the way that I see it, it's, it's that virtual version of that personal relationship. Yeah. You know, how do you start to get that in and then start to you know, use it in a, in, a, in a way that's pleasing to the customer? <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, it sounds so easy. It's only <laughs> been 40 years of been trying to get it right. Uh, and so again, I think that the interesting stat here is the corollary here, which is 70% uh, right. that, that don't feel like they have it right yet. Mm -hmm. And so again, I think listening to the, uh, the gentleman from uh, Expedia earlier, like one of the opportunities we have is when you think about our paid media spend is how do we go smaller to go bigger, right? How do we engage customers who already likely have demand because they're high value customers for us, because there's some event that's triggered the need for whatever it is that we sell, rather than the spray and pray of trying to create demand. And so you heard, uh, you heard the gentleman from Expedia talk about, hey, someone who maybe books a bunch of two-star hotels with us regularly uh, is probably a better target for us in terms of ongoing engagement and service than someone that books one time in a five-star uh, but spreads their business around through a bunch of different channels or a bunch of different suppliers. And so I think the key here is how do you build the loyalty uh, around the person rather than loyalty around the program? And so, for example, um, think about a, a customer who uh, maybe only travels once or twice uh, with you a year, but takes advantage of everything you have available. All of your partner uh, opportunities, all of your uh, in-service and inexperience offers that you generate. That's probably a better person for you to engage than, than someone who maybe travels often, but never really engages with you outside of the actual core thing. The room, the flight, the car, whatever it happens to be. And so there's this opportunity to start figuring out, irrespective of where they are in the loyalty status, understanding what their loyalty is to us as a, as a provider. Uh, and it's a way better uh, opportunity in terms of how we think about our, our media spend and how we use that in a more you know, effective way and the efficacy of that spend afterwards. Right, and um, I mean, can you share a couple examples of specifically of you know, some brands that maybe you've worked with that have gotten this right or have, have you know, worked that path you know, maybe not getting it exactly right all the time, but doing a good job of it. Yeah, I think there's two quick examples. One is uh, Alaska Airlines, 
who you know, did a really good job in starting to blend together their revenue management systems, their marketing tools, their loyalty programs. And so what happened was not necessarily, think about the, the, the sexiest use cases. Oh my gosh, they, they traveled 10 more times with us than they did last year. It's actually not often those sorts of things which are most delightful to us as a traveler. Sometimes it's something as simple as suppression. Right? Hey, download our mobile app. Hey, I've been using your mobile app for five years. I use it every month. I would love not to get the stocking stuff or email asking me to download your mobile app. Um, those are just really small things that you can do to help lead this breadcrumb trail of, of customer delight and helping, that the, helping the brand really drive home the fact that they know me, they understand me, and they engage me when it's appropriate and on my terms. Uh, rather than getting to a point where I have to block them uh, and I lose, uh, I lose that channel altogether. Uh, that's one example. And then another Wyndham uh, for us is a good example where going small to go big. So, so uh, creating a smaller set of audiences with a higher lifetime value because the reality is, although we love to think of every customer as our best customer, not every customer is our best customer. Uh, and so Wyndham really drove, I think, triple digit uh, return on ad spend, email, uh, open rates and conversion by simply just going to where the demand is. And you have to do that by understanding who your best customers are, which is understanding that first party data. Right. You already have that data. You already know who your best customers are. Great. Um, and you know, we talked about at the beginning, what are the stakes in the big picture of getting this wrong or you know, really right? You know, what's the opportunity and what's the advantage of getting this all right? Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's so much more fun to talk about this stuff in terms of experience and customer centricity and delight and all of the things that we desire as travelers, me going back to Seattle tomorrow. I have a whole list of things I would love to have, have happen for me during my trip. But I think the reality is when it comes time to build projects at our companies, you know, the easiest way to measure this is in economics, probably not smiles, although smiles are a really good indicator of long-term economics. And so you can think about for the company I mentioned, ad spend, what if we didn't you know, target people that were unlikely to engage with us and we could save that money? What if we didn't send a bunch of profiles out for enrichment that don't need enriching? Uh, what if we didn't rent our customer experiences from third parties, but we built our own first party uh, data graph and we took, we took control of the ownership of our customer relationship? Uh, for, for travelers, I think we understand the economics bene you know, economic benefits for travelers in terms of when a brand gets it right and our desire to reward them with more of our business. And then one thing that we don't often talk about are the employees. So there's a, a customer who integrated their, I think I mentioned it, integrated their uh, travel res system with their contact center and support systems. So when these customer service reps, arguably not the most fun job, maybe at the, at the supplier, are, are answering calls, they're delighting them because they know exactly why they're calling, what they need, and they're able to close the case before the customer can even fully explain what the problem is. You can imagine how, how life-changing that is for us as travelers, but think about how life-changing that is for the customer service rep for the very first time who just takes complaints and calls all day, now really delivering on the brand promise. And they want to. Everyone at our companies wants to delight our customers. And so you have to give them the opportunity, and that means giving them the data. Right, well, Barry, we're out of time. Thank you so much. Everyone, download the report that we worked on with Amparity, and thank you again for your time. Thank you.